Okay, so this was the last slide that we covered. And in this, we actually saw that if both C and A in your complex exponent, if both of them are equal to one, then what happens? So if you see here, we have this C e raised to the power of A T. This is your complex exponential. This is your exponential signal. So if both A and C, both of them are complex, then what happens? We can just write C in terms of polar coordinates, A in terms of rectangular coordinates, plug in the value, we end up getting this long statement right here. Then we just take all the values with T on with the complex part on one side and not having complex part on the other side that so that we have e raised to the power of RT into e raised to the power of J omega naught plus phi T. Now this part as we see right here, this is simply complex exponential. The only difference is that instead of one constant value, we have a constant value omega naught plus any other constant value. So makes no difference still. We have e raised to the power of j. सर आपकी आवाज नहीं आ रही So we are back on. Let me see that we have the slides with you. Okay. We have the slides. So last time we were seeing this that we have this uh, complex exponent. Now, complex exponent, again, what that thing is, it is basically a complex frequency also because it is going to have a real part which is also a sinusoid and imaginary part which is also a sinusoid. So e raised to the power of j something t and that something can be any constant value. And typically we write that constant value in terms of 2 pi times something because that constant we also refer to it as angular frequency and 2 pi times something and that something is actually the frequency. So omega equal to. So this whole quantity right here is basically angular frequency and typically we write it in terms of 2 pi times any particular quantity and that quantity is basically your frequency in terms of hertz. So complex exponent has a real part and has an imaginary part. So let's see that this is the real part cosine 
and this is the imaginary part sine. If it was just complex exponent, then it will be just cosine and sine. And we can draw the sinusoid. Everybody know what is a sinusoid and how does it look like? Here the difference was that the magnitude, instead of being a constant magnitude, the magnitude was having again an exponent in it. And this actually means that the magnitude also was changing with time, either like this or like this, depending on whether this R that you see right here, if this is positive, then sorry, if R is negative, it is like this. If R is positive, it is going to be like this. Let me just correct this. This is not this. It is basically R less than zero. If R is negative, then it will be a decaying exponent, right? So this magnitude part, if you see with time, the magnitude of your sinusoid is decreasing here and magnitude with time is increasing here, right? So if we take this first, R greater than zero or R positive, that means magnitude with time is increasing. So sinusoid that you have, its magnitude is increasing and this is what we get. The first oscillating sinusoid that you see, this is what you get. If you see the magnitude part, this is what is happening to the magnitude. It is increasing with time. And this is what we covered last time. I'm just repeating it because this is important and interesting. And if your R here was negative, if R was less than zero, then magnitude will be decreasing with time. Magnitude of this complex exponential will be decreasing with time and you will end up getting something like this right here. So this is again plot of your sinusoid, plot of your sinusoid, plot of the real part of sinusoid. Similarly, we can have a plot of the imaginary part, which will be instead of that starting from here, it will be starting from zero right here. It will be going like this. So it will be a sign there. So complex exponent, what that thing is, exponent, what that thing is, that I explained in all the slides that you have seen so far. Now, coming over to the real and imaginary part, they are sinusoids. So if you want to find out about e raised to power of j omega t itself, we know that e raised to power of j something constant times t. This is a complex exponent and we have called this as complex exponent, complex frequency or simply frequency because it has got a real part which is a sinusoid cosine omega naught t and it has got an imaginary part which is also a sinusoid. Right? So we can plot the real part. If this is periodic and this is periodic, that means both real and imaginary are periodic, that means this is also periodic. And we know that the period can be found out using this omega naught because omega naught, that constant, we tend to write it in terms of 2 pi f. This f is the frequency. Omega naught itself is angular frequency. And if you want to find out time period, that will be equal to either we can just take it as 1 over frequency or we can take it as 2 pi over omega naught, one and the same thing. So we can find out the time period for that thing also. So let's call that as t naught. <coughs> Any confusions here? This complex exponent we covered earlier also. This complex exponent again is something which especially electrical engineers, they play with this quantity a lot. Computer engineers, not that much, but you need to know what this complex exponent actually is and why it is so important for us. And again, this complex exponent you have, you will see later on in Fourier and other types of transforms and why we use that, we are going to cover that also later on. Although you have covered that mathematical approach, but once we cover it in this course, it will be practical approach. Okay, now we covered two things, which was energy and average energy or power. So if you want to find out your energy, now what we can do is we can find out energy in one time period. Energy in one time period for this complex exponent. It is a, a periodic thing. So if you find out energy in one period, that will be from zero to T naught. Time period is T naught. 
it will be the single square times uh, single square integrated or summed up over the whole duration. Now this square of this complex exponent ends up coming out to be equal to one. Why is that? Why does complex exponent square comes out to be equal to one? Any idea? Complex exponent, why that thing turns out to be equal to one. So if you see this, e is the power of j omega naught t. We know that this thing is actually equal to what is having a lag? Cosine omega naught t plus j times sine omega naught t. Right? So it is basically this part. Right? Just take the square of this. What should you get? It should be cosine square omega naught t minus sine square omega naught t plus 2j cosine omega naught t sine omega naught t. Is that right? What? This is not equal to 1. Is that equal to 1? Sir, you square minus 2j. Why? If I take square of this thing, what will be the square? So, j sine omega naught t. If you take square of that, sine omega naught t square into j square, what is j square? It will be minus 1. So this is something that we see. Now, this confuses people that what is going on? Why do we say that that e raised to power of j omega naught t square is equal to 1? So to make the life simple, we say the magnitude square equal to 1. And if you remember your complex numbers, we had a plus jb. What was the magnitude of a plus jb? The high flyers in mathematics. What was it? OK, all of you are high flyers. So this was the magnitude. So if I take the square of that thing under root goes, it is square of the real part plus square of the imaginary part, right? So same value right here. If I take just square of the magnitude, the imaginary part and real part square, so it will be just cosine square omega naught t plus sine square omega naught t. Clear now? And what is this equal to? Cos square plus sine square. Cos square theta plus sine square theta. That is equal to 1. Now this actually brings us to a very interesting fact. If you are in, going to be an engineer now, you are doing graduate or bachelor's level studies. In high school, you may have learned something about square of numbers. Remember that a square. What was it? A multiplied by a simple high school i believe third grade fourth grade somewhere but that is what we teach high school or elementary school or kindergarten guys that this is a square so because all they have to deal with is real numbers only let's say a is equal to two this is the biggest problem for them and they feel uh, you can say satisfied that they are able to take a square of this thing but all they need to do is that if a is equal to 2, a square is then what? It is just equal to 2 multiplied by 2 is equal to 4. Simple thing, common sense. Now, once you grow older, you reach your FSC, you come across complex numbers. Let's say 2 plus 3j. Now, if I say a square, that creates confusion like this. We end up getting j and all that. So again, to keep you guys, let's say, comfortable, we say that just somehow the other memorize this. It is the real part square plus the imaginary part square. This is what it is going to be, and just 13. Then don't question, that's it. So that is what we teach, again, FSC and maybe high school. Just give me a second. Now, typically, 
the actual thing would be the square is actually not this multiplied by this. If it is complex number, it is a multiplied by a conjugate. What's a conjugate? Complex number with the imaginary part sign flipped. This is valid for real number, valid for complex number. Now again problem comes in once we have a problem like this. If it is 2, 3, 4 and 5. If we have a matrix. Now it can be a matrix or it can be let's say a vector. Let me make a vector. Okay. If A is this. Now what is A square? That again is a trouble. So what is A square? Can we find A square? Can we find A square? In this thing. Can we find A square? Can we find A square? If you try to find A square by the initial logic, it will be 2 into 1 into 2 into 1. Can they be multiplied? Yes or no? They cannot be multiplied because row and column thing. So they cannot really be multiplied. So what happens in case of matrix? In case of matrix, our squaring thing is basically this. We say that our square is basically A into A. What is this? Transpose. transpose. What does transpose mean? Rows and columns get flipped. So in that case, this will become 2, 1 and 2, 1. Now we can multiply that. We can find out the answer. So for complex number, this for let's say matrices, it is this for real number. It is this. What if your matrix has got complex number? If this is a now what? Yes, then we say that it is basically the squaring part would be a into a transpose and conjugated. What is transpose conjugated? We have a name for this. Anybody ever heard of this? Later on in masters. Symmetric. It is not symmetric. It is. Anybody else? It is Hermitian. So what is Hermitian? It is taking a transpose and then taking conjugate. Transpose conjugate or take conjugate and then transpose one the same thing. That is known as Hermitian. So actual squaring magnitude squaring is just a into a Hermitian. At times they are just written together as a a Hermitian. This is actually squaring. This is actually squaring of the magnitude part of at times we just say squaring. Now this is valid for any type of number. Now you will see this. If we have a equal to two, what will be the Hermitian of two? Hermitian means conjugate and transpose. What is the conjugate of two? Still two. Transpose because single quantity, not a vector, again two. So it will still be this. So it is valid for this. If you see this complex number, A is this and a Hermitian would be conjugated part, which will be two minus three J and then transpose. It is single quantity, so it remains the same. So this is also going to be true because this squaring would be just what? Two plus three J into two minus three J. It is just A plus B into A minus B. What is this? A square plus B square. What is A plus B into A minus B? A square minus B square. But if you have a J in this B, that minus ends up becoming plus. You end up getting exactly the same answer right here. So same will be true for a matrix, for a vector, for a complex sort of a vector. It will be true for everything. Now this is sort of looking ahead, but later on you will not face any difficulty if you just think of the magnitude squaring part as just the number multiplied by its Hermitian. And this will be true for all. Now we don't teach kindergarten kids this or elementary or high school kids this because by that time they are not exposed to matrices. They are not exposed to complex numbers. For them it is good enough that squaring is just number multiplied by itself. That's it. But later on, especially the master's guy, they should know all this. But typically this thing somehow gets skipped during your undergrad and once people reach masters at that stage, they are getting confused at what's going on.
Okay, so that was one way of looking at this part. So if we need to find out this, it will be just real part square plus imaginary part square, or in other words, let me just write it this way. Sorry, e raised to the power of j omega naught t. That will be the number a into what will be the conjugate part? e raised to the power of minus j omega naught t. Remember, conjugate is just wherever you see j, replace it with minus j. Don't try to just convert it into real and imaginary part, and then and then just uh, flipping the number. So if you just multiply these two together, the powers they get added. What do you get? e raised to the power of this minus this, which is zero, and this ends up becoming one. So very straightforward. We can directly write this, and that is what you saw once we saw it here. So they assumed you know all this and directly they wrote one. But with experience, I know that you know, you guys at times get confused that, okay, why? There are about maybe five, ten steps that you are habitual of taking and then it becomes one. How can we directly write one? We can directly write one if you know what is the squaring magnitude for any number. So that is that number multiplied by its permission. And if it is not a vector or a matrix, it is that number multiplied by its conjugate. So that is one way of looking. The other way of looking at the same problem is if you are given any complex number, we can represent a complex number as a rectangular coordinate that would be of the type A plus JB. So we can represent this as A plus GB that is cosine plus J times sine. We know this. The other thing is we can represent that number in terms of polar coordinates. Polar is basically R e raised to the power of J theta. So we can, this is also a complex number. So e raised to the power of j omega naught t is a complex number. If you want to represent it in polar coordinates, so it is basically the magnitude part, which is again one into e raised to the power of j, the phase part, which is omega naught t, right? So what is the magnitude part? Just one. So if you just see this number as a complex number written in polar coordinate shape, then magnitude of that number is just equal to one. We can see that magnitude part is already one. I hope you're getting this. So this is how you see that. Now, as an engineer, if you learn how to simplify things, how to engineer the simplest solution, your life will be very, very easy as an engineer. You will become a good engineer. And if you are that ritualistic sort of engineer who just very good with the, let's say, mathematics part, very good with, I don't know, the theory part. OK, give me it and I will just fill up three pages and give you an answer. Then you may be a good student. You may be having maybe 3.5 or 4 cumulative, but you will not be a good engineer. A good engineer always try to simplify things, always wants to engineer the simplest solution. OK. So if we just put one here and then find out the value, we see that in one time period, the energy comes out to be equal to T naught, which is same as time period. That's an interesting thing. And if in one time period, energy is T naught, if we just consider any one time period, this is starting from any particular point here, let's say this till this point, this is one time period. In one time period, if energy is equal to T naught, if energy was equal to T naught, how many time periods should we have in a signal, in a sinusoid? How many time periods should we have the whole duration? We have infinite time periods. It's an infinite signal, oscillating signal. So in one cycle, if energy is T naught and we want to find out the total energy, then total energy will be infinity because it's a cumulative thing. In over infinite duration, the energy will be infinity. This is that second example where total energy is infinity, but we can find the average. Average is basically total divided by the duration. Now, one way of seeing it is that, okay, total energy is infinity, total duration is infinity, it is infinity over infinity, so indeterminate. So we can always just write it here as P is equal to infinity over infinity, so cannot be found, right? That's one way of just looking at it. The other way of looking at it, which is more engineering approach would be, this is a periodic signal. So whatever we have in one period, that thing is being repeated throughout. 
from minus infinity to infinity. So if you find out average in one time period, that average will be there throughout. Make sense? Because this is a periodic signal. We have so many periods. We have so many periods. And these periods go on and on, on this way and this way. So infinite periods. So we just find out energy in one time period and take average of that energy in one time period. So that will be the average throughout. And that is what is done right here. So one time period is basically T naught. And energy in one time period was also T naught. So it is basically just T naught over T naught. The periodic uh, signal, the average energy or power that we get is actually equal to one, right? This is just one example shown right here for complex exponent. So a lot of things were covered here for complex exponent, starting from very simple. We can have both C and A real, then just A complex, then both A and C complex, how they look like. Then just we talked about our e raised to power of g omega t because this is a complex exponent which we'll come across again and again and again. And why we keep coming across it again and why it is so useful, it will become clear. If not by the end of this course, by the end of DSP, you'll be absolutely clear that why this complex exponent e raised to power of g omega naught t is so important and where all it is used. That was the complex exponent. Now let's come towards more computer engineering part, the simple part. That is for this uh, unit impulse and step signal. So two types of signals we'll see here. What is a, a unit step signal? What is a unit impulse signal or step signal or impulse signal? What are these? So let's first talk about a unit impulse signal. Let me, and then we are going to talk about unit step signal. We covered this earlier also. In introduction, we covered what is a step signal? What is an impulse signal? Did we cover that? Yeah. Okay, here we are going to go a bit more deeper into this. So, unit impulse signal is a signal which is uh, one only at, if it is discrete, only at n equal to zero. The value is one. Rest throughout it is zero. So, that's a unit impulse signal, delta n. We have a symbol for this. We call this signal as delta n. That's a unit uh, impulse signal. Now, mind you that if you have delta n minus 1, how should it look like? How should it look like? Delta n minus 1. Instead of this being at 0, it will get shifted by one time unit towards right. We covered that shifting part. Did we? Did we not? Okay, we're going to cover it later on. So let me I just, I'm jumping ahead. So forget about that shifting part. We're going to cover it later on in about two or three slides later. So let's just talk about unit impulse signal and unit step signal. And unit step signal is a signal which is zero from minus infinity all the way to n equal to zero. And at n equal to zero, it becomes one and then remains one all the way to infinity. So this is what your unit step signal is. We have a symbol for that. We call this U of n. So these two signals, delta n and U of n, very, very important. And you will see that your digital electronics, discrete electronics, computer engineering, it will just revolve around these basic types of signals. So delta n, if you just write it mathematically, its value is zero for all n's except for n equal to zero. At n equal to zero, this is one. This is how we mathematically write it, that it is equal to one at n equal to zero, and if n is not equal to zero, its value is zero. That is your unit impulse. And unit step, it is zero for all values of n which are less than zero, minus one, minus two, all the way to minus infinity. It is zero throughout. At n equal to zero, it becomes one and then remains one throughout. So that is your unit step signal. And this u of n, if we just shift it right by one time unit, then instead of starting from zero, if we just take this signal and just shift it right by one time unit, 
or we say we delay it by one unit. We have u of n minus one. That signal is basically something which starts from n equal to one, and then it remains one throughout. Right. So this is u of n minus one. So what we can do is, if we just take this u of n and subtract u of n minus one from it, just see these two, you will end up getting your first signal right here. So delta n, we can derive by just uh, subtracting a delayed version of unit step from unit step. You can get it that way also. Any confusions here? Very straightforward, simple types of signal. One is your unit impulse, the other is unit step. So, so the same thing is true to some extent for continuous time signals also. For continuous time also, we have unit impulse and we have unit step. Let's talk about the second signal first, which is your unit step signal. A unit step signal is zero throughout. It is zero throughout from minus infinity all the way to t equal to zero. At t equal to zero, it becomes equal to one. And then all the way to infinity, it remains equal to one. That's a unit step signal. So it just steps to value one and then remains there. So this is your unit step. And this is how we define it. We write it as u of t. This is u of t. So u of t is a signal which is zero for all values of t from minus infinity all the way to zero. At t equal to zero, it becomes equal to one and then all the way to infinity it remains one. This is your u of t. So unit step very similar to what we saw for discrete time. Right? No confusions here. The confusion arises here. Unit impulse. So it is very simpler, similar to this uh, unit impulse that you saw for discrete time, but this is something which requires a bit of explanation. Let me define a pulse. So if a signal starts at any value, t naught or zero or whatever, and finishes at, let's say it starts from t1 and finishes at t2. So this is your t. So that's a pulse, right? In simple terms, we call this type of signal a pulse signal. So this x of t is a pulse signal. Now, if this pulse is such that area of the pulse is equal to one, we will call that as unit pulse. So that will happen if let's say its magnitude part is one and this T2 part is one. So it starts from zero, ends at one. If you just find out the area, it will be one. So this will be what we call that, we call this a unit pulse. And this unit pulse, we call it not because of its value, because of its area. So a unit pulse is a pulse whose area is one, area under the graph is one, right? So if we have a unit pulse, then you just take integration x of t dt from minus infinity to infinity. What should you get? One. You'll get one because from minus infinity all the way to zero, this is already zero. We can write it in three parts from minus infinity to zero x of t dt plus from zero to one x of t dt plus from one to infinity x of t dt. That will be your area which we have divided into multiple parts. This is zero. This is zero because x of t is zero throughout. x of t is zero throughout. Here the x of t part is one. So one, zero to one dt. And if you just solve it, ends up giving us one. So in unit pulse, the area of the pulse is equal to one. Clear? Now, this is a unit pulse. Another example of unit pulse would be that if it starts from zero and finishes at, let's say one by four, if you need a unit pulse, what will be its magnitude part? Four. This is also a unit pulse because its area is one. So this is unit pulse, this is unit pulse. Now, if you further reduce it, 
let's say we say that 0 0.1 what will this become 10 so we can keep going on and keep reducing this we can keep reducing this if you keep reducing it its magnitude part will keep increasing right now let's take a limiting case if this duration that we have if this duration that we have let's call this delta t and this magnitude part that we have that will be 1 over delta t is that right now if delta t becomes zero if that becomes such a small duration that is becomes zero duration what will magnitude become magnitude will become not almost it will be exactly infinity we cannot represent infinity that's why we just put an arrowhead right here and this case where we have a pulse whose duration is zero we don't call it a pulse we call it a impulse the very English meaning of impulse is sudden. So this is an impulse and in the impulse, the duration of this impulse is zero. The magnitude part of this impulse is infinity. Right now you have signal generator in your lab. We can generate this type of pulse. Can we? From signal generator let's say we put voltage equal to one and time equal to one second and oscilloscope we are seeing very nice pulse we can generate any pulse which has got a finite duration we can generate this we can generate this right can you generate this why not two reasons first of all its time duration is zero and magnitude is infinity now both of these things cannot happen so this impulse which we call this as unit impulse. We have a symbol for that. We call this as delta t and the symbol we just represent it like this and we put a one sign right here. Now this one is not its magnitude. It is representing its area. So if you have a unit impulse, this is a unit impulse. The symbol for unit impulse is, as I mentioned, What I mean. So this is a unit impulse and interestingly if we just compute area under the graph of this unit impulse what will that be? From here minus infinity till just before 0, 0, just after 0 all the way to infinity again 0 at exactly t equal to 0 the area is actually equal to 1 so this area under this graph is equal to 1. Right. So this is something which confuses people at time that why we have got a symbol like this for delta t. What does this arrowhead represent? And what does it, this thing actually mean? Delta t, the value is zero if t is not equal to zero. At exactly t equal to zero, the value is infinity. So this is something which is kind of different. So this unit impulse again as you can see is a theoretical thing how do we use this why do we use this if it is theoretical then why are we actually talking about it this will become clear once we go into the theory part of it now just like we saw relationship between your unit impulse and unit step for discrete for discrete time signal there is a relationship between this uh, unit step and unit impulse signal for continuous time also if we just talk about area under the graph from minus infinity till the time t for delta tau d tau, right? If we have this type of a thing, this is your axis, let's say tau, and here we have your delta tau. So area from all the way to minus infinity till any time, till any time t, till any time t. And you just plot that area from minus infinity. If you plot this area from minus infinity, once the value of t, once the value of t 
when the value of t is let's say minus 2 minus 3 minus whatever negative value the area will be zero throughout and exactly at tau equal to t or t equal to sorry zero only at t equal to zero the area value becomes one and then as we move forward the area after this also just remains one does not change so this is what this thing actually means so this is something which you call as ut this is your u of t if you just compute the area from minus infinity till any point t and plot it that would be your relationship between your unit step and your unit impulse or simply put we say that integration of delta t up till the time t or in other words, let me just be more technically correct. The area under the graph of unit impulse till the time t is actually your unit step signal. So this is the relationship between both. And the converse is also true. The differentiation, what is the opposite of integration? Differentiation. So if we take the opposite part, that will be also be true. The differentiation of u of t will give you delta t. Why? If you take differentiation at any point, differentiation is rate of change. If you take rate of change at any point, ut is already zero, so there is no rate of change. At all these points, the differential of u of t will be zero. At this point, we have a sudden change. Now, differentiation is increase in y over increase in x to be more specific, rate of change. So in this t equal to zero, Increase in y is 1. What is increase in x? 0. So 1 divided by 0 is what? Infinity. And after that, again, the rate of change is throughout 0. Right? Confuses you guys? Okay, if it not it, if it is not clear right now, once we go further on and start using it, it will become more clear. The major part is that you should know what's a step signal. You should know what's an impulse signal. That's the basic part. Now, the only catch in these types of signal is once we talk about unit impulse signal delta t for continuous time. That's a specialized signal. That's a theoretical signal. Okay. This actually. Right. I'm just getting started. Okay. Let's have five minutes break. We have finished the slide set. Rest is just MATLAB. We are not going to cover MATLAB. And once we come back after break, we are going to start with slide set number three. Okay, just about five minutes break, please. Make sure it is five minutes, not 15 minutes. Thank you. 
Okay, slide set number three. And in this slide set, we are going to talk about <coughs> your systems. So we saw a few things about signals in the previous slide set. And here we are going to talk about systems. And we'll start from very basics. And again, you can see that initial few slides talk about all the topics we are going to cover in this slide set and also refer to the relevant sections that will be there. <coughs> so let's talk about systems. So in systems, first of all, we saw there are different types of systems. Now, what a system does, it takes some input, does something to it and gives you an output. So it transforms your input signal into an output signal. And out of the different types of systems, our linear systems are important for us and time invariant systems are important for us, as I mentioned in my introductory lecture also. And I will keep referring to these two types of systems again and again, linear and time invariant systems. And together, we call both of them as LTI system. <coughs> so LTI systems, it can be a continuous time system, it can be a discrete time system. And if you see that how we actually represent a system, here you can see, if the input is x of t with parenthesis and output is y of t and again t in parenthesis, we know that we are having a continuous time signal as an input and continuous time signal as an output. So that means we are talking about a continuous time system. And similarly, if we have x of n as an input and the output becomes y of n, we are talking about discrete time signals. That means the system that we are referring to is a discrete time. Otherwise, both of them are represented by a square box with arrow coming in and arrow going out. So this representation we covered in the introduction also. So some very basic things. The other thing we saw in the introduction lecture was that we can write an equation which gives us a relationship between input and output of a system. If it is a continuous time system, you would see that invariably we will end up getting a differential or differentiation inside that equation. And that equation will be called differential equation. For mathematician, a differential equation is an equation which has got a differentiation in it. For engineers, a differential equation is an equation which defines a system, a continuous time system. And Real systems has got input like this, Vs, and output like this, Vc. But typically, we don't write equations like this once we are dealing with the courses of signals and system or DSP. We just use the symbol Y for output. And if we see that this is some constant, whatever that value is, so we say that plus some constant time Y of t is equal to some constant time x of t. Typically, we write an equation like this. So if you write an equation like this, it becomes more, you can say, nice to look at. And x denotes the input, y denotes the output. Now, in real life, that x can be anything. It can be, let's say, source voltage. Y can be anything. It can be, uh, let's say, voltage across of a capacitor or current or whatever. But for us, signal system people and signal processing people, we say that, we have an input x and output y. And again, looking at the equation, we can say a lot about a system. And by the time we finish DSP, you will become experts of just looking at differential equation and saying that, OK, this is a low pass filter. This is a high pass filter. This is an amplifier. You can just look at the equation and have a sense of what that system does. And that is something which at times impresses other guys like mathematician and all that, that how a person is able to see that as a system. Now, right now, that may seem a very far cry, but right now, if you just see a something like this, y t is equal to 2 times x t. I hope anybody can just see it and say that, well, this is a system, it's an amplifier system. It just amplifies the input two times. <coughs> well, this thing, again, will be something you can boost for in front of elementary school guys or maybe high school guys. So you can just see that equation as a system and call it an amplifier system which amplifies two times. But again, as you just go along the signal system and DSP, 
you will get the expertise of looking at differential equations and say things about the type of system we are dealing with. Some things we can say directly, which mathematicians can also say that what is the order? It's the first order differential or second order differential, and accordingly, it is a first order system or a second order system. Now, what that means in terms of system, that will become clear once you study DSP, that how a second order system differs from first order system, that types of thing. So in discrete time, if we try to write an equation which relates input and output, we invariably end up getting <coughs> difference terms and the equation that we get we call that equation as a difference equation so uh, time systems are defined by a difference equation a difference equation is an equation which gives us relationship between input and output of a system okay i can see a question here yes uh, LTI, the equations, uh, also include a you see lti we have to see that what are we talking about? It is a discrete time LTI or a continuous time LTI. Okay. If it is a continuous time LTI, it will have a differential. If it is any continuous time, it will have a differential. So how, how That's a separate thing that what is a linear system? Now, don't correlate that linear system with the linearity that you see in mathematics that Y is equal to two X is a straight line. So that graph is a straight line, it's a linear equation y is equal to 2x square is curve so it is not a linear system so in that matter what is y is equal to 2x plus 3 linear non-linear linear but if you have a system it will end up becoming non-linear you see that's an interesting thing because the property of linearity is kind of different once we talk about systems linearity property we'll see about two or three slides later in that property and we'll use that property to develop the first theories we'll use also the linearity property for discrete time for this uh, systems is that if we have two different inputs then what type of output should we get with x1 we get y1 with x2 we get y2 if we just give scaled sum of these two input as an input a composite input now the output that we get will be a scaled sum of the output that we should expect to get. Now, is that so? Does that happen? If that happens, then we say that we have a linear system. If that does not happen, we say we do not have a linear system. And again, once we talk about systems, we are going to see examples where seemingly the equation seems uh, linear in nature, but practically you're not going to get that type of thing. And we're going to come to that in a few slides. Okay, so a discrete time system, once we try to write an equation which gives us a relationship between input and output, invariably you will end up getting a difference. This y of n minus 1, we can have n or y of n minus 1 or x of n minus 1 or 2 or whatever. So that type of equation will be a difference equation. And we already talked about this, that the equation that you're seeing here, this is sort of a bank balance where x is the monthly deposit that you're doing the present input type of thing and output is your y and again we can have a weird looking equation where you have let's say v's and all sorry v and f these types of things but typically we don't use that type of thing so this v that you see here is output so instead of just writing it as v of n our convention will be that we will use y and Whenever multiple constants are there, we just lump them together and write it as one constant. That way, the whole equation looks much nicer and much easier to deal with. Now, we may have higher order systems also. For example, a discrete time second order system where we have a second order differential. So how do we describe the order? It is the highest order of differential that we have in differential equation or highest order of difference that we have in difference equation. And here we can see that what type of response we get once we use those equations for system. Now, the left one, we see a continuous time system whose equation is given to us. And instead of x of t, we can give a particular input. Now, this u of t minus 1, this is the input part. 
So we can give this input and try to see that what sort of output we can get. And these types of things we do in MATLAB using Simulink. In Simulink, we can just uh, uh, drop a box and inside a box, you can write a differential equation that dy by dt plus a times yt is equal to xt. And the xt that is coming in, for that xt, you can just give different values to xt. Now xt can be a step signal, u of t. It can be a delayed step like you see here, u of t minus one. If you see, u of t is a signal which starts at zero, which starts at zero and then becomes one at zero and then remains one throughout. That is your u of t. So what should be u of t minus one? It has to be a shifted signal and it shift will be a shift right, right? If you see here, instead of this yellow line starting from zero, it is starting from t equal to one and then be remaining one throughout. So this is your input. This is your input, right? And if you give this input, we can just see what sort of output we get. What will be y of t? So this is your x of t and this is your y of t. This is your x of t. This is your y of t. So we can give different x of t and just see the plot of how the y of t will look like. So these types of things we can do in MATLAB using Simulink. Similarly, we can use difference equation and see that what happens once we use difference equation. So here again, the equation that you see is a difference equation and this is basically your input. So instead of giving it x of n, sorry, we can just first of all drop a box where we can just write an equation inside that box. Okay, this is the system and it should obey this equation. And input is x of n, output is y of n. And for x of n, we can give different values. So we can give shifted version of step signal or scaled shifted version of step signal. Here you can see it is having a scaling factor of k. So that k can be 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever value you want to give it. And u of n minus 1 <coughs> is basically just your step signal shifted right by one time unit. So we can give that input and see what output is. So in this particular case, the green lines that you see are the input and the red lines you see are the output y. So these types of things we can just do in MATLAB. So the take home thing from here is that we have a continuous time system, discrete time system, continuous time described by differential equation, discrete time defined by difference equation, and we can use MATLAB to just uh, write an equation and then give different inputs or different values to x of n or x of t and see output y of t or y of n. We can do that. So MATLAB can deal with both types of things, discrete and continuous both. And these are the type of things you may practice in your lab. Okay, now coming to that question about linearity. Now, this is the interesting thing. So what is linearity? It is one of the most important properties that we have in system. And two important properties that we are interested in are linearity and time invariance, because you will see that all our theories that we are going to study throughout our engineering and later on in life also are based on that assumption that your system is linear and time invariant. Now, what happens if your system is not linear? What happens if your system is not time invariant? Then <clears throat> these theories fail. Then different theories have to be used or these theories have to be modified and used. For example, a nonlinear system, we can still use these theories of linearity, but we can just apply it with small, small patches and small, small, patches, assuming that system is linear for a small duration. So again, those techniques are covered in higher level mathematics, uh, higher level uh, masters and PhD level courses. In undergrad and even in basic masters, you're not going to deal with nonlinear system or time variant systems. Those are complex systems and complex theories are required for that. OK, people sitting here, please write your attendance on a piece of paper. For those online, I can always see who are online and they can just mark it accordingly. Any questions? So we are going to cover this uh, part next time because this is serious part, linearity and properties. We'll cover that next time. So online guys, any question? So if there are no questions, then this is all from my side.